Okay, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello to everyone who's joined us so far. We had a pretty good number of people register for this webinar. So those people who will be tuning in late can always um, watch the recording to miss the um, exciting stuff in the beginning. But I wanted to start by introducing myself. So my name is Hope Newport. I'm the Family Services Manager here at the IFOPA. And I work to connect um, families and individuals with FOP with the resources we provide. So this is just one um, resource that I'm really excited to share. This is a new program. So we're gonna be talking about the Resilient Living Program here at the IFOPA um, today in our webinar. I wanted to go over a few housekeeping rule or just information pieces to get started. So just so you all know, you're muted. Um, so if you're trying to talk to us, we won't be able to hear you, but there is a chat and a Q&A um, button on the little toolbar that you'll see either at the bottom or the top of your screen. So if you have questions as we're going along, please feel free to type those in. Um, if you do the Q&A feature, they'll just be viewed by um, myself. But if you do the chat feature, um, then the entire group will be able to view them. So feel free to use those if you have questions as we're going. And um, I also just wanted to remind everyone that this webinar will be recorded. So if there's information or if you're a note taker, please don't feel pressured to write everything down because you'll be able to go back and view these slides and, and hear um, this presentation again this week. It will be online. So I am um, excited to introduce you all today um, to a member of the Turning Point organization. Her name is Haley Stolzel. <laughs> um, and Haley has been leading resilience trainings for Turning Point since July of 2018. So she trains um, patients and their families as well as nurses, doctors, and other healthcare professionals. As she was a facilitator who um, trained the IFOPA leaders. So our executive director, Michelle Davis, and I participated in a training with her at Turning Point. Um, she started her time at Turning Point as a patient participant and she has multiple chronic health conditions, including an autoimmune illness, a heart condition, chronic pain, and a very rare neuro, um, neurovascular disease called erythromyalgia that it took years for her to be diagnosed. Um, and prior to her time at Turning Point, Haley worked as a public health specialist for both the U.S. Centers for Disease Control in Atlanta and the Peace Corps in Botswana, Africa. Um, so Haley is going to start off the presentation by giving you all um, sort of an overview of the Turning Point Resilience Framework, and then I am going to pick it up from there and tell you a little bit about the Resilient Living Program here at the IFOPA. Hi, everybody. So let me first just say what an honor it's been to work with Hope and Michelle and the IFOPA. And it's a great organization. There's a ton of resilience already um, within this population. And so I'm so honored to even learn from you all as well. So um, just a brief intro to Turning Point. So we are a community resource of the University of Kansas Health System. And we provide free programs to um, patients and their families. So anybody who has a serious physical illness or a chronic condition, we provide free nutrition classes, free exercise and movement classes, free relaxation classes, as, as well as um, kind of how to cope with the emotions of living with a serious illness. So as Hope noted, I started my time with Turning Point as a patient, and now I have the privilege of being a facilitator. And we have this 10 facets of highly resilient people program, which I'm privileged to share with you all today. So let's go ahead and get started. So first of all, what do we even mean by the term resilience? So what we mean within our turning point model is the ability to bounce back and recover from life's challenges. So this means addressing our situations, our challenges head on versus avoidance or denial. And it also requires uh, the ability to kind of be able to hit the reset button and create feelings of calm, strength, and meaning. So there are a ton of benefits to resilience, as you can imagine. Um, this includes better problem solving, feeling more in control of our emotions, less critical of others, able to just be more hopeful and optimistic overall, 
and even manage unexpected setbacks. So there are a ton of um, research out there as well as just proven abilities to cope better when you're able to work on resilience. So there's a couple things that you might hear me state throughout the uh, presentation that will come up again and again. And the first thing is that resilience really requires um, an awareness of our emotions and what brings us anxiety, pain, or stress. And then once we're aware of what brings us anxiety, pain, or stress, we also need to have the skill set to be able to cope with that. So we've developed um, at Turning Point this evidence-based model that we call the 10 facets of resilience. And so this is based off of dec decades of resilience research. And we found that these 10 qualities or facets are what make people resilient. And what's really cool about our model is that even working on or addressing one area of this model helps you build your resilience in other areas. So it's really a model that builds off of itself. And so what I thought I'd do today is just kind of give you guys kind of a high level introduction to each of these facets and also provide some quick ways that you can um, start working on them as well. So some strategies for resilience. So let's go ahead and get into it. The first facet has to do with the ability to self-calm. So what this means is being able to manage our emotions and the stress of life, as well as um, our exposure to trauma and the ability to regulate that response. So it's not about ignoring or stuffing your problems. Instead, it's that awareness piece of being aware of your stress response and then actively trying to recover. So examples of this would include regular relaxation exercises, doing some breathing exercises, you know, there's meditation, a practice called positive self-talk, listen to calming music, or even just connecting with the energy of calming others or calming people is really helpful for the ability to self-calm. So why is this important though? So as we know in life, stress can tend to accumulate. And unfortunately, our body doesn't really discriminate between kind of smaller everyday stressors and really big life stressors, you know, those more traumatic life stressors. So what happens is our body experiences the same biochemical chain reaction by each of these types of stressful events. And so for us, it's pretty unrealistic to say, well, I'm just going to avoid stress altogether, right? That's pretty difficult to do. So when it comes to managing stress, it's about recovery. So there's something that you guys might have heard of in um, other opportunities. So that's the fight, flight, or freeze response. And this is our natural biological reaction to a stressful or traumatic situation. So we have this thing in our brains called the amygdala. And the amygdala kind of serves as our fire alarm. Um, when it senses a stressful situation, it can trigger then our hypothalamus to flood our bloodstream with what we call stress hormones. So things like cortisol or adrenaline, um, are pumped into our bloodstream to help us react to the situation. So this is an adaptive part of our human biology, it serves a purpose, but unfortunately what can happen is we can get sort of stuck into this fight, flight, or freeze response, or that kind of can tend to become our default mode. So if you look at this bottom figure here of the autonomic nervous system, on the left side there is the sympathetic nervous system, and on the right side is the parasympathetic nervous system. And you can think of the sympathetic there on the left as kind of the accelerator on the car. So when we get into fight, flight, or freeze mode, we are putting on the accelerator. We're ramping up our um, response to that stress. And so a healthy nervous system is able to regulate back and forth in between these periods of activation and periods of rest or digest, which is what's on that right side with our parasympathetic nervous system. So again, it's not about avoiding fight or flight altogether, sometimes that will just happen with um, the stressors in our environment. But with this ability to self-calm, what we're able to do is regulate back and forth between activating these two systems. So a little bit more on the fight or flight. So we can actually stay in that state of fight, flight, or freeze even after that stressful situation is over. So the importance of that is when we're in fight or flight or response, we're not at our best, okay? Our ability to problem solve and think critically and manage our stressors is um, limited. So when we can get better at self-calming, we're able to regulate back into that parasympathetic activation, 
which is when our brain can think more clearly and get to more of that problem solving and critical thinking state. So I put one self calming strategy on here just to give you guys an idea of what we're talking about. This is a relaxation mantra that um, you would start with just noticing your breath and trying to take slower and deeper breaths and then think of a word or phrase that helps you kind of relax. So something like it's going to be okay or I am strong and you would think these words to yourself as you take that deeper breath. And over time, as you repeat these phrases and you get better at practicing this, your brain will start to become conditioned to as soon as it hears that phrase, it's going to help you regulate down from that fight or flight response. All right, so that's the ability to self-calm. We're going to move on to self-care now. So self-care are all of those behaviors that we do to take care of our bodies and also to balance the effects of physical stress. So this could be exercise or regular movement. It could be eating good foods, nutritious foods, good hygiene, you know, getting enough water, trying to sleep when we can, and then doing regular relaxation exercises. There's another facet that's closely related to self-care. So self-replenishment is an aspect of self-care, but instead of being all those behaviors to take care of your body, Self-replenishment are activities that help us refill our buckets and recharge our batteries when life is extra heavy or when we're feeling a little bit down. So if you can think about, you know, walking through life, we all have this invisible bucket that depending on what we do throughout our day or what we say and how we interact with other people, we're constantly being drained. And so replenishing activities are things like music and humor and laughter and time with family, maybe time outdoors. All of those things that help us recharge and refill. So with this, we need to be better at doing these kind of recharging and replenishing activities as a routine versus waiting for ourselves to feel empty. So really trying to build some of these replenishing activities into our schedule is the important takeaway here. All right, so now there is something called emotional expressiveness. So with this, we're not talking about necessarily, you know, you have to wear your heart on your sleeve or express emotions outwardly. With this facet, what we're really talking about is acknowledgement. So giving our emotions the space to be felt. So it sounds really simple, but it's a very powerful tool. So what you would do is you would try to recognize what emotions you're feeling and then give yourself permission to feel that feeling inside without judgment and without trying to talk yourself out of it. So what this does, if you imagine like a pop bottle being shaken up, this is releasing a little bit of that pressure out of the emotion, a little bit of that strength, so that we're not as easily overwhelmed by those emotions. And there's some harmful ways. So these are the ways, even if you kind of self-identify as this is what you do with emotions, you're not alone. This is what the majority of us do. So we have a tendency to stuff or ignore our emotions or make ourselves feel guilty for having an emotion, or we can even try to talk ourselves out of it or convert an emotion to a different emotion. So this is kind of the norm and we wanna get better at giving our emotions the space to be felt and acknowledged without judgment internally. So there's one really helpful way to do this that I put in the slides, that's a challenge reflection. So you, once a day, you would think of something really difficult about your day and you'd pay attention to how it made you feel inside. So you could even get in tune with how it sits in your body. So for example, if you felt angry, how did that anger show up for you? Was it heaviness in your chest, the knot in your stomach? And all you do is allow yourself to sit with that raw emotion and maybe tell yourself something compassionate, like, wow, I was really angry and that's okay. I am not my emotions. But all you're doing is you're giving some space for those emotions to be felt. All right, so moving on, um, there's one more strategy I put in here for emotional expressiveness, but this one is invoking self-compassion. So there's a researcher, Dr. Kristen Neff, you can check out her website, but she says there's three types of phrases you can say to yourself when you're having an emotional response. One is you just acknowledge that this is a moment of suffering. You could also say that suffering is a part of life and acknowledging that you're not alone, you know, we're all fighting our own battles. 
And then the third thing she says that we need to acknowledge, what do I need to hear in this moment as a piece of comfort? So that might be a compassionate phrase. You might tell yourself, you know, may I be patient? May I be kind to myself in this moment? But these are three aspects of self-compassion that can really help us when we're going through an emotionally difficult time. All right, so that is the facet of emotional expressiveness. We're going to move on to facet five, which is our non-judgmental self-supporting facet, or also we like to call it kind of our letting go of perfectionism facet. So with perfectionism, we're holding ourselves to really unattainable, very high standards. And when we don't meet those standards, we judge ourselves pretty harshly. Everyone does this. We're all prone to perfectionism. So with this facet, what we're trying to do is let go of perfectionism, um, which doesn't mean we have to stop setting goals or standards. What it means is we're removing the judgment and we're being able to trust our efforts and ourselves and others when we've done a good enough job. So we've checked all the boxes, we've done what we could, and we're able to move on without dwelling on whether something's perfect or not. So a big part of this is actually learning to recognize our inner critic how that shows up for us, the messages it's telling us, and then try to replace those messages with something that's more supporting. So I have an exercise here that's really helpful. It's called the flip it exercise. So that inner critic likes to tell us harmful or negative messages, kind of tear us down. And so you would think of a message that you're commonly telling yourself or that comes up for you, and you'd write that down or note it, and you'd look for any harmful language or extreme language. So maybe some always or nevers or some extreme language like stupid um, or a big one is look for the shoulda, woulda, couldas. So I put an example over there on the right of negative self-talk. Maybe you would always tell yourself, man, I should have or I could have done more to help. Okay, so that's an example of our inner critic. And then the last piece of this is we try to, after we note the inner critic, we flip it to a more positive self-supporting message. So for that example, instead of saying, man, I should have or I could have done more, you'd say, I did what I could with the knowledge, skills, and resources that I had at the time. And that's enough. So that's a key takeaway there is that a lot of times our inner critic is giving us a hard time that we're not enough. We don't do enough, and so looking for ways to be more positive and self-supportive. All right, so asset six is optimism. And when we're optimistic, we can kind of have like a general overarching view that things are gonna work out. Um, and with the right kind of effort and time, we can improve our troubles. So with optimism, we're not talking about putting on our rose-colored glasses or ignoring reality. Instead, we're trying to believe that in spite of troubles, we're gonna get through this, okay? So optimism works hand in hand with hope. Hope is kind of the backbone. If you think of these two facets working together, hope is the backbone for optimism. So when we're hopeful, we're able to see a pathway to that brighter future when we're optimistic. So hopeful people set goals and come up with ways to achieve those goals. In fact, there's three parts to hope. With willpower, it's the ability to set goals. There's way power. Can you see multiple pathways and different ways of reaching that goal? And then the very key part of hope is having follow through. So can you be flexible enough to see your goals through? Because as we know, life rarely goes as planned, right? There's health issues that come up, financial issues that come up. And so we need to be able to see how to be flexible and work around Sometimes we even have to change the original goal in the first place, right? So hopeful people are very flexible. And there's a way that we can train hope and optimism. So you'd start by just setting a goal and then coming up with smaller, very achievable baby steps to reach that goal. And then kind of brainstorm if there's barriers or limitations that you might encounter and then even go as far as thinking of, okay, how can I do some multiple pathways or course correction when I'm gonna hit these limitations? All right, so that's hope and optimism. And we're gonna move on to hardiness now. So hardiness is all about growth, seeking growth even in hardship. And there are three aspects of hardiness. 
So when we're hardy, we're able to kind of stay in, stay committed, and engaged even when times get tough. So that's the commitment part. Then with hardiness, we're looking for what part of this crazy difficult situation can we control and putting our attention and awareness there. The last piece of it is honestly just looking at challenges as opportunities for growth um, versus kind of becoming stuck or immobilized. So there's a way we can train hardiness too. So it's called situational reconstruction. So uh, for example, you can make a list of some of the circumstances or difficulties that you've got going on right now that are not resolved. And what you do is you just take one of those situations at a time and you would try to first imagine, okay, how could this situation become worse? And then you'd spend some time thinking, all right, well, how could it get better? And the reconstruction piece is you'd identify what pieces of this situation can you control that would make the likelihood of it getting better to be more likely or stronger likelihood. And then the most difficult part of this, though, is number four, which is you try to let go of the pieces that are beyond your control and really trust that whatever you do is going to make a difference. So letting those other pieces that you can't control fall away and putting your efforts and energy into those pieces that um, you can control. All right, so that is hardiness. Then we have this facet called sense of coherence. And this is probably our most abstract of the 10 facets, so I'm going to spend a little bit of time explaining this. So with sense of coherence, we based this facet off of the research of Dr. Aaron Antonovsky. And Dr. Antonovsky is a researcher of Holocaust survivors, so those who lived through the Holocaust, and looking at resilience traits among those survivors. And he was able to come up with this concept of sense of coherence. And what he found is that to have a strong sense of coherence, you have to believe that you know, life is ultimately very meaningful, it's a gift, and how I respond to my struggles really matters. How I respond to my suffering matters. Um, and then there is the belief that you have to look for resources out there, that ultimately life is manageable when we seek supportive resources. And finally, he saw that um, people who could kind of seek out consistent experiences uh, were more resilient. So even when the world feels really crazy and chaotic, it's important to seek out consistent experiences and look for what we can establish um, in our world to be more understandable. understandable. So there's a couple of quotes I put here that help illustrate sense of coherence. Um, these are from the book Man's Search for Meaning by Viktor Frankl. So Viktor Frankl is another Holocaust survivor. Um, he developed a whole form of therapy off of um, his time surviving the Holocaust. And these quotes really uh, demonstrate what we're talking about with sense of coherence. So when he quotes Friedrich Nietzsche in his book, he's saying, those who have a why to live for can bear almost any how. And he says, everything can be taken from us, but one thing, the last of human freedoms to choose one's attitude in any given set of circumstances. So for Viktor Frankl and Aaron Antonovsky, what they saw is that people who viewed life as what they can contribute or how they embraced their suffering are those folks that were able to stay in, stay committed, and be more resilient. All right, so gratitude is really, really effective for building our sense of coherence. And gratitude practices can actually help quite a bit of these facets that we've talked about today. But in terms of sense of coherence, how it helps is kind of getting us to live with two truths at the same time. So what I mean by that is, okay, let's say you're going through a really rough time. You can hold that in one hand. And at the same time, you can also realize what's really going well. What are beautiful gifts in your life? So calling to mind things that you're grateful for and trying to make this a routine, whether that's with your family, you know, finding a time of day that you can share gratitudes, um, or doing some journaling if you do it yourself. But there's a few questions I put here. So you're just trying to get in touch with um, things to be thankful for and holding those two truths um, at the same time, that life is very difficult, but I also have many beautiful things happening in my life too. 
All right, and our last facet is social support. So with social support, we're talking about any friends or family, um, peers, uh, other patients or coworkers who can be there for you in good and bad times. So social support systems need to be diverse. Um, you know, we can't rely on just one or two people to be our everything. We need to really have a multitude of people that we can turn to for resources or encouragement. Um, the other key part about social support is that we need to have reciprocity or, you know, have reciprocal support between groups. So there are several ways that we can strengthen our support network. You know, for example, just doing a better job of trying to be a good supporter ourselves. So whether that's staying in touch, um, reaching out to people, being a good listener when people need, you know, some extra support, or just challenging ourselves to note, all right, how can I be a better, better loved one um, and look for ways for self-improvement. But one of the best ways we can strengthen our social support network kind of goes back to that gratitude practice of just being able to show constant appreciation for our friends and family and let them know how much they mean to us. Um, and also to be proactive, just reach out um, and affirm others, invite others to share your interest. And that's um, some ways we can improve our social support network. All right, so I want you guys to keep in mind, so we've got these 10 facets of resilience, right? That we've gone over just now, kind of at a high level. And that's because there are things that will always happen that are beyond our control. So we need some skill sets and tools that we can cope with the difficulties in life, the heaviness of life, the pain and the suffering. Um, because no matter how much we try, there are always going to be things that happen beyond our control. But the good news is, is that we can actually control our brain and our response to stress. So just like we've demonstrated with these facets, there's ways that we can train our brain and support ourselves and our loved ones that help us be better at managing stress. One of the things I want you to keep in mind, because I've kind of thrown a lot of information at you with these 10 facets, is again, working on just one area of resilience has the capacity to make a huge impact. So working on just one thing will have kind of a trickle effect on to other areas of resilience. So that's a really cool part of it. The other thing to remember is that seemingly small things make a difference. So, you know, just reminding yourself every once in a while to take a deep breath, kind of hit that reset, and reset button, give yourself some compassion. Um, you know, you can even set reminders on your calendar, or your watch, or your phone. Um, but check in with yourself regularly throughout the day so that you're able to let go of this um, stress response and do that recovery piece that we talked so much about in the beginning. Um, so even something as simple as tuning into your breath and trying to do a breathing exercise a couple times a day improves our ability to regulate stress as well as difficult emotions. So again, we're not talking about adding a bunch of time to our daily routine, we're talking about seemingly small little things that we can do throughout our day to help us be more resilient. And it really all boils down to feeling our true feelings, learning how to calm our stress response, learning how to restructure and flip our thought patterns from harmful ones to supportive ones, and then constantly working towards um, self replenishment or filling ourselves up with positive and nourishing experiences. So these are kind of the primary takeaways from that 10 facet model. So I've included some additional resources here. Um, we have a turning point resilience toolbox on our website that you can check out. I'll have all sorts of cool resources there on sleep, on nutrition, on exercise. We also have some breathing exercises, as well as some specific meditations. So a pain management meditation, a loving kindness meditation, and some other recordings there that we've had some really good luck with our patient population. And then I also included on here, um, for those of you who have a smartphone and would like to use some apps, there's some really good apps for Kind of calming the stress response and having some ways to regulate stress. So that's Calm, Insight Timer, Headspace, and Mindfulness app. So 
you can check those out. Um, a couple of those are free, and then some kind of have a trial period where you can try it out before you have to do a subscription. So those are some additional resources for you guys. And um, again, thank you for this opportunity to share information and learn from you all as well. We'll be anxious to hear um, the discussion in the rest of the webinar. And uh, as I wrap up my portion, just note, here's the references. And I think what we're going to do now to kind of transition over to Hope's presentation is to leave you guys with some group reflection. So I put a couple of questions here. Um, and I'll go ahead and turn it over to Hope. Yes, thank you, Haley, for that um, very exciting, quick overview of Turning Point's resiliency faucets. If you, um, speaking to all of our attendees, if you guys have anything similar to my experience when I listen to all of this information and when I think about the benefits and the impact that it can have on my life or on the lives of those that I love. I just feel sort of overwhelmed with this urge to take action and to start, you know, fixing everything that I see in life that I want to improve on. So I think before we dive into, you know, the ways that the IFOPA will be incorporating this information and sharing it with the community moving forward, we wanted to give you all just a quick breather to um, to kind of sit with this information and to think about, you know, your personal experience and maybe some of the anxieties or stressors that you want to focus on um, and just what you're doing currently to manage those. Um, so we'll give you all just a quick second to think about that. Um, And if you want to share things in the chat, you are more than welcome to do that. But also feel um, free just to take these questions in and think about them um, privately for just a minute. And so I'm sure you are all able to come up with a list in a short amount of time um, of things. And, and as Haley mentioned, um, you know, we're going to talk about some specific things that the IFOPA is doing that maybe you'll associate right away with, oh, this would be a good support for me in this area. Um, but again, this knowledge is something that if you, if you develop one benefit or one skill, you're really improving your overall resilience. So just remember that as we're going through this, that you don't have to be involved in every single program or every single um, resilient living experience that we're offering, um, but whatever you can contribute or be involved in is, is a benefit to you. So I wanted to start, um, before we get to sort of a larger overview of our resilient living program by pointing out that this program is brand new this year. So uh, Michelle Davis, our executive director, and I completed the training with Turning Point in March. And um, the opportunity to do that was all thanks to an organization called Global Gene. So I'm sure many of you are familiar with them. They are an organization that supports patients, families, and the rare disease um, organizations associated with each different diagnosis in the rare disease community. And so we received a grant from them um, the end of last year, and we're excited to be able to launch this program and see it grow not only this year, but um, throughout the future of the IFOPA. And to share sort of like a, a bigger overview of how this resilient living program will work within our community, um, I've highlighted three different areas. So the first is the community development. So as um, Haley mentioned, they do a train the trainer training at Turning Point. So Michelle and I received the training, and now we're able to train additional members from our community in this resilience framework and um, the activities, some of which Haley mentioned, um, and facilitating these for other groups of people. So this increases the reach of the program, but also um, with the small staff that the IFOPA has, it really helps us be able to meet more of our, um, our patients and our families and the needs that they have. It also provides a great educational opportunity um, for growth and development for those people who are interested in working towards this mission um, that Resilient Living focus on, 
resilient living focuses on. Um, it also has this ability to strengthen our FOB, our FOP community by training community members and allowing them to share and facilitate these exercises. Um, and I did just want to share that this train the trainer, the first training we're going to do is going to be piloted with the mentors in our FOP Connect Peer Mentor Program. So that's a program that we started last fall, and we have 10 mentors who um, are available to pair with different community members. They're from um, you know, different backgrounds or different roles in the FOP community, and we are gonna be starting their training um, next week. So the 1st of May, they'll be the first training for this group, and they'll be available to um, mentor or partner with people and so if you're really interested in jumping in and sort of being the benefactor or um, and getting the experience to practice or try some of these activities, I would definitely recommend that you check out our FOP Connect program um, if you're interested in connecting with those. So the next aspect I want to talk about is community involvement. And this is a really important part of the Resilient Living program because, as I mentioned, um, with the small staff that we have at the IFOPA, we felt that including leaders within the community or people who are really passionate about this cause was important. And so those community um, leaders or our peer mentors, for example, will be really integral, integral in um, being the ones to share this information with the community. So we realized that with mental health related issues um, like this, it's often important to have a personal connection and to have some sense of um, shared experience with the people you're working with. So I think for our community members to be able to participate in this way will also enhance the sense of purpose that they have within our community as well. And the last thing I just wanna point out, which Haley has already covered, is the strengthening factor this will bring to the FOP community. So I think it's obvious with the resilience faucets and the benefits that they have, um, how this will strengthen our community overall. And it is important to mention that this um, is not just for adults, it's, um, there's also child specific um, trainings or activities to do. So this is something that will really benefit everyone in the community. And I'm gonna talk about three specific areas that the Resilient Living Program is um, focusing on and supporting the FOP community. So we know that everyone faces stressors on a daily basis. Haley talked about how um, you know, it's impossible to avoid them all. <laughs> And realizing that these stressors are compounded by the illness um, is an important focus of the Resilient Living Program. So to be able to um, provide this information in a digestible way, um, we're going to be doing several different things. One, you can keep an eye out for weekly resiliency posts on social media. So these will be little nuggets of information that you can integrate over time. We'll also be doing sort of quick fact info sheets to help you understand um, some of the more complex factors. So if you were sort of struggling to keep up with um, the fight or flight process and everything that our body is going through when um, we're facing stressors, those we're gonna be creating some fact sheets to help you be able to learn a little bit more about those um, and really take them in in a more um, individualized approach. So, and then another thing that we're doing is offering a top 10 tips for being resilient resource. So this is something that will kind of encompass what Haley's spoken about, um, but in a quick way that you'll be able to reference on a daily basis. So maybe it's a handout that you put on your fridge um, and just look at, you know, when you have the chance. But rather than just offering one training, I wanted to highlight some of the little things that we'll be doing so that people can access this information over time. Um, and then it's also important, we realize that in addition to those universal stressors, there are FOP specific stressors. And so we wanted to make sure that we're focusing on providing support um, specifically for some of the fears in our community that we reference, you know, waking the monster um, or sort of when you're going through a flare, knowing that the FOP is active and how that could impact um, your planning for the future. And then also just the, feeling of isolation that comes with a rare disease and knowing that many of our community members are um, far apart geographically so they don't get the opportunity to be together in person, how we can work to support you um, in that social support um, that isn't right there in an in-person setting. Another aspect of um, the turning point faucet, resiliency faucets that we're focusing on specifically 
are your ability to manage medical stress. So this is, um, you know, we know that with FOP, pain management is a key issue and a critical part of supporting our community. And there's already a wide array of options available for pain management. Um, you know, at our last family gathering, we had someone who was speaking more about the traditional drugs. We did a webinar earlier this year um, on cannabis. And I know just from social media that people use essential oils and energy healing um, as different pain management um, methods. But one of the things that Turning Point uses um, and that Haley spoke a little bit about was that ability to um, do self-calming and relaxation and the impact that that can have for um, you know, not only managing the pain that, we're, that people may be experiencing during a flare, but also um, coping with some of the stressful medical procedures or the stress that people experience when they're in the hospital. Um, and so I also know that, you know, if you're going through a flare, or if you're hospitalized due to that flare, um, you're dealing with the pain and the stress of that. But because of the exciting stage that the FOP community is at with clinical trials and the drug development process, um, we realize that there is some additional stress from um, different medical procedures that are associated um, with those trials. So being able to cope with um, the potential anxiety of having to have a blood draw, um, this, these relaxation and self-calming things are an um, important tool for that. And so um, the breathing exercises, which um, Haley kind of alluded to, we know that connecting your breath to your body and your brain is an important part of this training. Um, and we want to be really mindful also of how important lung health is in the FOP community, um, but that it is also um, a potential barrier. It can make it more difficult for people to participate. So that's something that we'll be um, focusing on when we're doing some of these relaxation and self-calming um, activities or exercises. But those will take place in the form of um, guided imagery, of meditation. For some of our younger kiddos, we have um, videos where we can show Elmo teaching deep breathing or using glitter jars as more of a self-calming method. So we'll really be working on sharing the, this knowledge and these opportunities with all of you um, throughout the year. But there's, um, if you're planning to attend the 2019 Family Gathering, you'll have the opportunity to participate in several of these in a group setting, which is exciting. And um, we're looking at the possibility or the opportunity to do a webinar later this year with more of a guided imagery or a meditation experience so that you can be led through that if it's something that's um, very new to you. So the last aspect that I want to talk about that we're really focusing on within the FOP community is how this resilient living can strengthen our families. Um, and we realize that FOP doesn't affect just one person. The entire family unit experiences this diagnosis and this journey with FOP differently. Um, but we've recognized that parents and caregivers play a huge role in supporting their child or their loved one with FOP. And this um, places a high demand on their time and their energy. Um, so we want to focus on how we can help balance out um, the toll that that is placing on our caregivers. And one of the ways that um, we want to focus on doing this is on the impact that this has on the family and how they can work with um, the other siblings in the family or their spouses or partners. So realizing that caregivers need self-care and they need self-punishment and working on, um, you know, within our social media, how can we do that? I think social media is a great um, strength that this community has that we're already so active in supporting each other in that way. Um, but just also working on, you know, when you're using social media as an outlet, how can you make sure that you're um, accessing and using the tools to support you in the optimal way? And then for our siblings, we um, have created a handout for them that is already online, but it is focused on really acknowledging them and making sure that we're providing um, opportunities for not just our pediatric individuals with FOP, but also their siblings to feel um, involved in this family, in your family's um, steps to improve your overall resilience. And then we know that lastly, with spouses or partners, um, that chronic illness puts added stress on these relationships. So when we're doing a training, if you're able to participate in that, or when we're structuring you know, social media posts, we wanna make sure to focus on specific ways that can strengthen and support that relationship. Um, so now that you've heard, you know, um, some of Haley's 
larger or broader overview and some of the ways that the IFOPA focuses or plans to focus on providing more personalized support. Um, I wanted to give you a quick guide as to what to look out for um, moving forward with this program. So one of the things that we're doing that I mentioned is the snippets or the small nuggets of information that we'll be sharing on social media. So if you follow us on Facebook um, or Twitter, Instagram, um, you know, we'll be posting things on all of those different channels for you to just take, um, you know, in with your day. We talked with Haley or we heard Haley talk about how it's important not to just wait till the end of the week or, you know, that recovering from stress isn't something that you can do at one time. It's something you work on gradually over, um, over all of your time. So um, these are a few ways that we want to do that. And when we post, we'll be using this little resilient living logo that you see with the sun um, and the IFOPA logo. So you'll know, you'll be able to see it and be like, oh, this is something if you're, maybe you're feeling a little um, more tired or worn down that day, you take an extra minute to really focus on that Facebook post or that tweet. Um, and then I did also want to mention, mention that we will be adding a board on Pinterest to house all of these materials. So if you're, um, you know, kind of confused by websites and there's a lot of things going there that can be distracting, um, Pinterest will have one board where you can go and look and just read every um, resource that we've created for this program. You can also join, as I mentioned, our FOP Connect Peer Mentor Program as a mentee. So if you're looking for really one-to-one -one, um, relationships that you can build where you can implement these or you want a buddy who can help you keep accountable and practice some of these um, resiliency skills, then I think looking into our FOP Connect Peer Mentor Program is a great avenue. We um, allow you to select your mentor, so we have a sort of gallery or a list of mentors that you can um, read about each of our mentors and select a mentor that would work best for um, the connection you're looking for. And we also don't set any guidelines in terms of you have to meet with your mentor this frequently or you have to be involved in the program for this um, span of time. It's really, we wanted this um, mentor program to be something that works well for our community. So it's there for you to use as um, it works for you. And then um, another thing, if you are interested in, you know, really getting a much deeper understanding of this framework and in um, setting aside a significant amount of your time to understanding it and being able to share this information with others, um, you can reach out to me about signing up for our community champions training in the fall. So the community champion training is um, a training for those members of the community who identify that, um, you know, resiliency or that this resilient living program has a benefit to our community or to their family or to their family and friends. And they want to gain, they want to be a part of a train the trainer session. So for those people, um, please feel free to reach out to me. We are, as I mentioned, piloting this program with our mentors um, next month. And we will definitely be doing some fine tuning and continuing to personalize it for um, our community after that. But we're excited to be able to offer that opportunity this fall for individuals to, um, who are really interested in investing some of their time um, to be able to gain that deeper understanding. And then also this fall, I wanted to let you know, for those of you who are planning to attend our 2019 FOP Family Gathering in Orlando in November, um, that we will be hosting a pre-conference workshop. Um, so it will be taking place on the Thursday before the family gathering starts later that evening um, for individuals who are 18 and above. And we will be doing um, not quite a full train the trainer because we won't have time for that, but we will be focusing on a few of these faucets that are really pertinent to our community and integrating some of the pediatric activities or the kid focused um, information into that training as well. So that's another thing to look out for. The registration for that opens up on May 1st with our family gathering registration. So just next week. Um, so that is sort of a high level overview also of the um, resiliency living program here at the IFOPA. And as I mentioned, we are doing our first training next month, but we're really excited to start sharing this information with the community and to hear you know, what, it, what parts of it, it it is that they are really passionate about learning more. And I think one of the beauties of um, the ability to get this grant from 
the um, Global Genes Organization is that it's something that we can use not just this year, but now that we have this knowledge from Turning Point, we'll be able to implement new programs and activities on this for um, with this information for years to come. So um, with that, I wanted to open it up to questions. If anyone wanted to reach out um, about a question they have regarding you know, being able to interact with a specific um, program that I've mentioned or aspect of this program that I've mentioned, or if you have a specific question um, about the resiliency faucets, um, we would love to welcome those. So. Well, if no one has any questions, um, I wanted to thank you all for taking some time out of your day. I know the middle of the day can be a hard time to get away from everything, but I wanted to thank you for joining us to hear about this program. And um, you can always feel free to follow up with me directly um, or to check it out. The recording will be on our website later this week. So thank you all for joining us and I hope you have a great rest of your day. Thanks, everybody.